All right, I'm gonna go ahead and call to order the Retirement System Board Trustee meeting Friday, February 19th, 2021, called to order at 8.03 a.m. First will be the uh, roll call. I'll start with myself, Lee Colick, chairperson. Uh, I'm attending from Royal Oak, Michigan. Next we'll go to Brent Nelson. He is, serves as the uh, vice chair. I'm present from Troy, Michigan. Thank you. Next we'll go with Commissioner Kyle DeBuck. Um, he is a trustee. I'm here in snowy Royal Oak, Michigan. <laughs> Thank you. Next we'll go to um, city manager Paul Brake, serving as a trustee. Uh, present here in Royal Oak. Thank you. And Commissioner Monica Hunt, um, also a trustee. Present here in Royal Oak. All right. Thank you. We also have with us Julie Rudd. Uh, board Chief Administrative Officer, Board Secretary, Board Treasurer. Present. Thank you. You know what, I just realized that Lisa is not on, is she? Yeah, I'm uh, sending an email to Carol right now to see if she's in the waiting room. Okay. Thank you. Do we need to wait for the recording in the minutes or? Um, I started taking notes. Okay, okay. perfect. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue then. We'll go with uh, Tom Michel, board attorney. With Tom, Rising and accounting for. All right, thank you. And Terry Gerlich with the investment advisor SCI. Present. All right, thank you. Looks like uh, Lisa was able to join as well. Administrative assistant, pension technician. Present. All right, thank you. Brings us to public comment. Carol, did we have any public comment on this one? You have no members present in the attendees in the audience for public comment today. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to make a motion requesting that the board approve the agenda for the February 19th, 2021 meeting. Is there support? I have support by, support by Paul. Um, I'm a yes. Brett? Yes. Kyle? Yes. Paul? Yes. Monica? Yes. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and make a motion that the board approve the minutes for the January 22nd, 2021 meeting. Is there support? Support. I have support from Brett. All in favor? I am a yes. Brett? Yes. Kyle? Yes. Paul? Yes. Monica? Yes. Thank you. Next is applications, adjustments, and benefits as follows. Robert A. Barger requests for domestic relations order acceptance, requests that the board approve the below recommended resolution regarding Robert A. Barger's DRO dated December 30th, 2020. Whereas the board is in receipt of the domestic relations order dated December 30th, 2020, wherein Amy Barger, the alternate payee, is awarded certain rights to the benefits of Robert A. Barger, the participant, and whereas the alternate payee is entitled to claim a portion of the participant's retirement benefit from the retirement system, which should be paid as soon as administratively feasible, and whereas the board's policy is to require that the costs for the actuary's calculations are to be borne by the parties to the domestic relations proceedings, and the order provides that the participant and the alternate payee shall be responsible for any and all additional costs for actuarial services. And that the alternate payee's share of said costs shall be in proportion to her share of the participant's benefit award to her under the order. And whereas said matter had been discussed with legal counsel, who has opened that the applicable term of said court orders are consistent with the provisions of retirement system and applicable law, therefore be it resolved that the board acknowledges receipt of said court order and will pay pension benefits consistent with said order as soon as administratively feasible. And further resolved that a copy of this resolution be immediately attached as the top sheet of the pension file and other appropriate records be kept for the retirement system relative to this matter. And resolved that copies of this resolution be sent to Robert A. Barger, the participant, Christine G. Strasser, attorney for the participant, Amy Barger, the alternate payee, Ronald W. Rickard, attorney for the alternate payee and the board's actuary. 
Amy Barger, alternate payee of Robert E. Barger, retired from DPS on March 9th, 2019. Amy Barger's gross monthly benefit payment as the alternate payee of Robert A. Barger is 545.35. Request for board approval for the gross monthly benefit payment of 545.35 to Amy Barger as the alternate payee of Robert A. Barger. Applications, we have Catherine M. Shidlowski of the Police Department, ROPOA Bargaining Unit, 26 years and eight months of service credit. Request retirement date of March 26, 2021. Eligible based on years of service and age. Christopher N. Anetta of the Police Department, PCOA Bargaining Unit, 25 years. He purchased eight and a half months contract time of service credit. Request retirement date of April 15th, 2021. Eligible based on years of service and age. Christopher N. Anetta requests an estimated pension payment in accordance with the following policy. Effective January 1st, 2020, the board will allow for payment of an estimated pension payment for certain new retirees that make the election due to hardship. The estimated calculation will be calculated by taking 75% of the straight life calculation using average base wage only. Base wage that will be utilized in the FAC excludes roll wins, years of service, and the applicable multipliers. Any under slash overpayments will be paid slash collected. This policy will be available to those employees with the retirement date of January 1st, 2020 through August 31st, 2020. At the July 10th, 2020 retirement board meeting, I lead college motion to continue paying estimated payments for January for, from January 1st through August 31st each year, as long as the criteria is met by the applicant. The motion was adopted unanimously five to zero. Retirement benefits, James P. Cook of the Fire Department, Fire Bargaining Unit, 34 years and three months of service credit. Retirement date of October 27, 2020. Selected option D, 75% to surviving spouse, 830527 gross monthly benefit with withdrawal of contributions of 160,80831. I'm going to go ahead and now make the motion to approve the adjustments, applications, and benefits as listed. Is there support? Support, support by Brett. I'm a yes, Brett. Yes. Kyle. Yes. Paul. Yes. Monica. Yes. Thank you. Brings us to investments and I will turn it over to Terry. Hey, thank you and good morning, everyone. Let me pull up the, uh, okay, hopefully. I'm gonna, oh, there we go, okay, hold on. There we go. And can everybody see that? Market performance uh, uh, re- overview, everyone able to see that, that slide? Yes, I hope. Okay. Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, um, as you can see, it was a fairly quiet month, just looking at the blue bars uh, on, on, on the right. Uh, some asset classes up, some down. Basically the theme has been, uh, uh, we, we saw, while large cap was flat, we saw a big rally in small cap, which you might remember small cap was really strong last year as well. Um, a lot of that could be, at least on the month, driven by a lot of uh, uh, speculation that seems to be going on in the market right now. Uh, but the other thing I point out too is uh, you know, interest rates uh, uh, are starting to climb and uh, that's causing uh, uh, bonds, investment grade bonds to trade off uh, a, a little bit. Um, so, um, I think the theme that we're, that we're seeing right now in the markets is that, and that will continue this year is market concern about reflation, that, that inflation may pick up uh, a little bit here this year. Uh, most, uh, forecasters are predicting strong economic growth in 2021, you know, 4% plus type of growth. Um, so we, we, with, with a rebound after in, in the economy as uh, COVID comes under control, uh, particularly in the last half of the year and with uh, the, the continued stimulus by the Fed, uh, Federal Reserve and, uh, uh, and Congress, 
uh, the expectation is that there will be quite strong growth. As a result of that, we're seeing, as I say, we're seeing inflation expectations go up a little bit, and we're seeing interest rates go up, uh, react uh, even, uh, even, even more. Um, and so I think that's something we'll be talking about for, uh, uh, for, for, the, for the remainder of the year, probably. Um, if we go to, uh, we can see um, uh, the portfolio relatively flat for the month, uh, and we'll see the performance uh, in a second. You know, all the, while, while there were a couple areas of strength in the portfolio, bonds were given back a little bit, resulting in fairly flat uh, uh, performance for the month. Um, here you see the returns. Let's see if we can make this a little bigger. Um, and uh, just focusing on either the one month or year to date column, they're obviously the same. See the portfolio is up eight basis points or six net of uh, uh, net, net, net of fees. So as I say, fairly uh, flat with equities slightly down. Uh, and even within equities, as I mentioned, pretty much a mixed market with large cap down, but small cap up. Um, and, and similar sort of pattern in the non-US portion of the portfolio, developed international, international generally uh, down like the large cap US, but emerging market equities uh, uh, were, were, were rallying. So it was a small cap emerging market equity rally in the, uh, uh, for stocks. And then in fixed income, you can see uh, down 68 uh, basis points uh, as, as a whole. And you see the, the effect of the rise in interest rates on the core fixed income fund um, and down 86 basis points uh, for the quarter. Emerging market that's similar, uh, both exposed to that rising interest rate phenomenon. But high yield uh, was able to offset that since it's more about credit than interest rates and high yield. And, and uh, with, the, with the rally that we saw, is particularly in small cap, was sort of a risk on trade. And we saw, we saw investors uh, feel fairly confident about the credit uh, outlook and high yield uh, did well uh, in, in, uh, in, the, in the month. So diversity certainly, certainly helps here. I, I know and I almost hesitate to say, because I, because I've said it for the last couple of years, it seems like at the end of each year, you know, the, the discussion has been, well, you know, it's been a great run on fixed income, core fixed income, but you can't expect much going forward because interest rates are already so low and certainly been wrong in that outlook the last couple of uh, years as rates could went even lower than we th that thought that they could. Uh, now we're finally maybe seeing a bottom and indeed we're going to start to see that struggle that, that we've been, you know, concerned about. So we think core fixed income is going to be a tough place to uh Make money still an important component in the portfolio. It's important to 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 provide downside protection if the economy were to weaken. Core fixed income would tend to rally as rates came back down, uh, but it's going it's going to be tough to look at that as a return generator going forward this year. Core property uh, at Evans only marked once a quarter, so there's there's no real updated number uh, there. But if we go to the next slide. Um, the other source of strength in the portfolio for the month was uh, structured credit fund. And again, credit outlook continued to improve uh, uh, and, and structured credit uh, continued its, its strong uh, rally that's been going on for the last several months now. Um, and you see up 4.4% uh, just, just for the month. So been a volatile asset class, but uh, uh, was a real driver of returns. Uh, in the month. And then finally, uh, again, very early in uh, 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 private equity, we've got no new news here. This is, this, this is only once a quarter. So there's nothing really to report there as well. Uh, you'll see that in the quarter, any updated numbers in the quarterly report. So that's the story. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Terry. Does anyone have any questions for Terry at this time? All right, I'm going to go ahead and make a motion to receive and file the information as provided. Is there support? Support. There's support by Brett. Um, all in favor, I am a yes. Brett? Yes. Kyle? Yes. Paul? Yes. And Monica? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. I'm going to move on to legal now and uh, turn it over to Tom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, recommendation would be to approve the reports as presented on the agenda, please. 
I will go ahead and make that motion. Do I have support? Support. Support by Brett. Thank you. All in favor, I am a yes. Brett? Yes. Kyle? Yes. Paul? Yes. And Monica? Yes. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome, thank you. Um, Julie, did you have anything? I have no other business, thank you. All right, thank you. Anyone else, uh, anything under other? If not, we will move forward to setting a date for the next meeting. Looks like tentatively we're looking at Friday, March 19th at 8 a.m. Does that not work for anyone? Okay, for me. Okay. Yep. So that's good. I'm going to go ahead and set the date of the next meeting then for Friday, March 19th, 2021, 8 a.m. That said, I'm going to make a motion to adjourn. I have support by Brett. All in favor, I am a yes. Brett? Kyle? Yes. Paul? Yes. And Monica? Yes. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all. And uh, talk to you next month. All right. Thank you, Terry. Thanks. Uh, meeting is adjourned at 8.19 a.m. <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and call to order the Retiree Healthcare Investment Board meeting for Friday, February 19th, 2021. Call to order at 8.19 a.m. First, we'll begin with the uh, roll call. Myself, Lee Colick, Chair, I'm attending from Royal Oak. Next, we have Brett Nelson uh, serving as Vice Chair. Could you say that one time, Brett? I couldn't hear you. Yep, I'm present from Troy, Michigan. Perfect, thank you. Um, Commissioner Kyle DeBuck serving as a trustee. You're in Royal Oak. All right, thank you. Uh, City Manager Paul Brake, also serving as a trustee. Uh, present here in Rylock. Thank you. And Commissioner Monica Hunt, serving as a trustee. Present in Rylock. Thank you. Um, also present, we have Julie Rudd, Board Chief Administrative Officer, Board Secretary, Board Treasurer. Present. Thank you. Lisa Genord, Administrative Assistant, Pension Technician. Present. Thank you. And Brian Green, Anko Investment Advisor. Present. All right, thank you. Public comment. Carol, did we have anything on this one? There are no members of the audience present to make public comment. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna make a motion to approve the agenda for the February 19th, 2021 meeting as their support. Support by Paul. All in favor, I am a yes. Brett? Yes. Kyle? Yes. Paul? Yes. Monica? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. I'm going to make a motion that the board approve the minutes for the January 22nd, 2021 meeting. Is there support? Support. I have support by Brett. All in favor, I am a yes. Brett? Yes. Kyle? Yes. Paul? Yes. Monica? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, Brian on this one for investments. Perfect. So a couple things to uh, to walk you through. First piece I wanted to show you, just really from a from an interesting standpoint. So there's been a lot of discussion as of late around you know what happened, particularly in the month of January, with stocks like um, like AMC, GameStop, BlackBerry, Nokia. Um, you know, and, and are we expecting some fundamental changes to the market? And I had seen this chart um, and a, a portfolio manager show me this chart a couple of years ago that I thought was kind of interesting. Um, but it, purely for, for personal interest, this one came across my desk the other day. So this is um, AMC's 2019 fiscal year and looking at revenue versus expenses and, you know, why, why would a stock like this have such a huge short interest? Or why would there be such a large uh, percentage of the investment world looking at a stock like AMC and saying, you know, the stock's at five today, I think it's going to be at four tomorrow or three or two. 
And I don't think it's going to go up just based on some of the pressures. So this is back in 2019, generated five and a half billion dollars in revenue. Uh, 1.7 billion of that came from food and beverage. And what's interesting about that figure is it only cost them $279 million to generate 1.7 billion in revenue. So that $5 or, or $8 um, box of popcorn that you buy costs them like a nickel to make. Um, but what's amazing is just how thin their operating margins are. You know, that year in a normal year, they only made about $136 million in profit, about a two and a half percent margin. That's pretty thin. And this is all predicated upon normal box office sales, which average about $200 million a week. Um, that's what they did in January of 2020 before the pandemic hit. In January of 2021, they're averaging between 10 and $15 million a week. So you can see the case for why a stock like this would be such an attractive um, opportunity from a short selling standpoint, uh, but amazing to see the impact that it's had in the overall markets. Because if we take a step back and go to uh, what happened in January, as an example, you know, as Terry had mentioned, it was a small cap and emerging market led rally. You know, one of the measures we use, small cap stocks are up 5%. Um, that, you know, markets were largely mixed. It was really a risk on environment in terms of, of small cap stocks and emerging markets benefiting. But if you look at this 5% figure, um, <clears throat> if you back out, it's about 50 names. So 50 out of 2,000. So about 50 stocks that have significant short interest. Or put a different way, 50 names where a number of Wall Street investors are saying, I think the business is fundamentally flawed and it's going to decline it and, and, the, and the stock should decline in price. You know, names like AMC, GameStop, businesses that are in, in a very, very difficult environment. Um, this index isn't up 5%. This index is only up 1%. So it's really interesting. We've had this conversation, it seems like, year in and year out, where the performance of the S&P 500 is driven by the FANG stocks or now the Fat Man stocks when you, when you roll in um, Tesla. Um, here in the month of January, you saw five or six names really lead the way in terms of driving performance for small cap. And if you didn't own them, you underperformed. But... <clears throat> As much as that drove performance in the month of January, it's also caused a, a, shift, a pretty big shift in performance here in February. So what hurt you in January, not owning a handful of names that honestly would be difficult to, uh, to own as a fundamental high quality investor, you're rewarded for not owning them here in February as a lot of those names have traded off. The other interesting thing, you know, S&P down one, fixed income in negative territory for the month as we saw rates rise. We've seen them rates, uh, rates actually rise even more. But I always think this is interesting looking at things from a sector standpoint. You know, if you go back and look at 2020, worst performing sectors are things like energy, real estate, financials, best performing sector, information technology, consumer discretionary. January, the number one performing sector was energy, real estate's in the top three, Tech, consumer discretionary, more middle of the pack. So you've seen a little bit of a reversal in leadership here so far in January. Just kind of interesting to see how the year has, has started off. But I think I've used this analogy before. If you think January has any predictability in terms of how the year is going to turn out for the markets, then um, you would also believe that how the Lions do in preseason football would be indicative of how their season record is going to turn out. So where do we sit? Again, I always love this chart, just talking about the overall success of the retiree healthcare system. Um, started with 105 million back in April of 17. Cash flow still on a net positive basis, uh, but is declining as we've been paying out uh, premiums and benefit payments over the last couple of years. But the markets added $35.8 million, even though we gave back a tiny bit in the month of January. Uh, you know, that 7.6% return brings us to $144 million. So it's still been a uh, successful endeavor for the community. So where do we sit? As I mentioned, gave back just a little bit of ground to the month of January, down about 44 basis points. And that's really a result of equity markets being in negative territory outside of small and mid-cap. But the S&P, for example, is down one. Uh, AQR's more defensive-oriented portfolio is down about 2%. Sizer 
continue to see a nice turn of performance here. Remember, they've been struggling for a while, uh, but in the second half of 2020, as we saw the market start to turn towards rewarding higher quality businesses trading at attractive valuations, you know, that portfolio has had a nice turn in performance <clears throat> held in there in January as well. And Cora saw a nice turn second half of last year, mixed performance here in the month. I'll take that mixed performance with a bit of a grain of salt, just because they were penalized for not owning names like AMC and GameStop in their portfolio. International is a bit of a mixed bag. Both First Eagle and Virtus underperformed uh, by a small margin, just as we saw markets get um, a little more volatile and turn mixed. JP Morgan, though they lagged a little bit, have, have held in and done quite well. And then finally, from a fixed income standpoint, a little bit more conservative positioning here with the Baird portfolio. Uh, held in only down 22 basis points for the month, but doing well on a longer term basis. Loomis uh, traded off just a little bit, but still holding in and actually done, is that, have actually done quite well over the long haul. And then real estate. Uh, a lot of zeros here, just we're one month into the quarter. This is going to price on a quarterly basis. Continue to see positive news and positive developments out of the portfolio. Um, if you read through some of the pieces that we've got included later in the agenda packet, you know, they've got a couple of projects coming online that they're finalizing construction that are predominantly focused on industrials. So a lot of <clears throat> e-commerce distribution on the East Coast that should be a, a great tailwind for them in the portfolio. There's been a lot of talk and a lot of press about, um, you know, pending kind of eviction crisis, right? We're, you know, a year into this pandemic. Um, in the month of January, the estimate was there was something like 10 million individuals that were missing rent payments. It's forecasted to be 16 million here in, in February. We had a meeting last week with the Presa team kind of talking through. Um, and while we're all on the same page in terms of kind of the, the moral impediment here and, and the need to potentially do something just to protect those individuals, specific to your portfolio, they're still seeing rent collections in the high 90% range. It was essentially where it was a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago. So there's been really no impact here just based on the location and quality of some of the buildings that they own. Uh, but it's something you should just be aware of that you're going to probably continue to see in the news and the press. But they've been, they've been well positioned and will continue to be well positioned and should weather any bad news we see from a real estate standpoint pretty well. So that's it from a performance standpoint. We're a month in. There's just not a whole lot of news to uh, to report. Portfolio is held in well. It's nice seeing a turn in performance out of that Sizerk portfolio. We do have one other piece to talk about here in just a minute, but I want to pause and see if there are any questions related to the markets or related to the portfolio as a whole. I don't have any questions. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. So the second piece that we had grab that here. <clears throat> so on a periodic basis, we like to review the investment policy statement. Um, and inevitably what happens anytime we review a document like this is <clears throat> um, you can think back to, um, to high school or college as an example, and it didn't matter how many times you proofread a document, you always found a spelling error traditionally after you turned it in. So we always like to review these on a regular basis, just from a from a best practice standpoint. And we have a couple recommended changes, but these are really minor tweaks. So none of these are substantial or foundational changes to the investment policy statement. Um, what we're really looking at here is just <clears throat> what I think of as kind of cleanup and clarification language. So the first is <clears throat> on page six, <coughs> one of the metrics we reference from a performance standpoint is we want the portfolio to meet or exceed the actuarial assumed rate of return. So the language in here references the actuarial's uh, earnings assumption of 775. We know that we've lowered that down to 725. So the recommendation we have here is just changing the language. Rather than expressly stating a figure, we just say the objective is to equal or exceed the actuarial assumed rate of return. So if that ever changes at some point in the future, you don't have to change a policy document to change that. And this really comes from, I'm a big fan of not having to change a number in multiple places, right? If we want to know what the assumed rate of return is, we're going to go to the actuarial valuation. 
and we're going to go to the summary annual report, right? That those are documents that are going to be continually updated based on any changes we make to that assumed rate of return. So if we ever change that in the future, higher or lower, this document will not require an update based on that. The second piece is really looking at things from an asset allocation standpoint. So, and this is just, I think of this as, as um, just clarification language. So we have long-term target allocations here that include real estate, include our domestic and international equity allocations. It includes our U.S. fixed income allocation. And it also includes up to 10% in other assets. And really things from an opportunistic standpoint, private equity, private debt, just different opportunities based on market conditions that may or may not be added to the portfolio. <clears throat> We've not funded any of those allocations yet. Now there's language in the investment policy that basically says, you know, if we don't have money allocated to this other assets column, it defaults back into things like domestic equity and domestic fixed income, because while we may have a 10% target to this, that money isn't just sitting on the sidelines waiting to possibly be invested. It's in the S&P 500 index fund. It's in the JP Morgan emerging markets portfolio. It's in the Baird fixed income portfolio. So that money isn't sitting idle. What I wanted to do really just from a clarification standpoint <clears throat> is add a table here that I referred to as transitional target allocations. And the difference here is from a long-term funding standpoint, we've got a 10% target to other assets. Here it's zero. So this is really reflective of where we sit today. <clears throat> and what we've done quite simply is taken that 10% in other assets and divided across the portfolio. So it's 1% in the cash, 5% into core fixed income. So that changes it from 15 to 20. And then 4%, <coughs> excuse me, into domestic equity. Now, one question might be, well, why didn't you just do it five and five? You put 5% in fixed income, you put 5% in domestic equity. And the reason is I can't in good conscience have a 70% target to stocks, right? 20% international. And if this were 50%, the max amount we can have according to Public Act 314 is 70%. So I think of this as the equivalent of, I'm driving down 696 and Brett is driving behind me in a professional capacity. If I don't wanna have a professional conversation with a member of law enforcement, I set the speed, I spent my, I spent my cruise control at 69 rather than 70 to ensure that I'm maintaining compliance with state law. And that means that fr from time to time we will have to rebalance that's a really good problem to have because it means the portfolio has grown above. But what this really does is memorializes where things are currently. Over the course of the next couple of meetings, we're gonna present some different ideas and opportunities to consider in this other assets column, in the private fixed income space, and some other opportunities from a real estate standpoint. So that will decrease what we have in domestic equity. Uh, but in the interim, I just want to make sure that we're adequately preserving and reflecting from a policy standpoint what we're doing in terms of the overall asset allocation. So again, this makes no changes to where we're positioned currently. It really just memorializes. So if someone new, you know, Commissioner LFU is a new member on the board, right? I read the investment policy statement and I go, wait a second, there's 10% here in other assets. I don't see that anywhere in the portfolio. It's really looking to this from an implementation standpoint. So that's it from my end. Any questions? No, it looks good. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. I'm looking forward to what you bring next month for sure. Anyone else have any questions or comments for Brian? All right. I want to make a motion to receive and file. Is there support? Support by Brett. All in favor, I'm a yes. Brett? Yes. Kyle? Yes. Paul? Yes. Monica? Yes, Monica? 
Monica's a yes. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Thank you. Um, legal, Tom, anything on this one? No formal comments, Mr. Chairman, other than right. be well. Thank you. You as well. Thank you. Julie, anything here? I have no other business. Thank you. Okay. Date of the next meeting has been set for Friday, March 19th, 2021, immediately following the, uh, the pension board meeting. I'm going to make a motion to adjourn. Is there support? Support. Support from Brett. All in favor, I am a yes. Brett? Yes. Kyle? Yes. Paul? Yes. Monica? Yes. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, meeting is adjourned at 8.38 a.m. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Yes, have a good day.